a bare PCB and now it's soldered and now we have the blinky LED but I promise you these did not happen with a snap of a finger. So today I wanted to share seven steps to bring up a board that I wish I had learned sooner and I'm going to show you these steps in action as we make a super fun custom Arduino board for a LoRa GPS tracker from start to finish so let's get started. In today's open source world of hardware, the barrier to hardware prototyping has lowered significantly. The internet is full of tutorials, talks, projects, examples, tips and tricks on electronics. So why do I take so long to get to a simple blinky LED? I'm not even trying to do anything complicated. And then I heard of the term board bring up, which is a phase process of taking many intermediate steps to achieve readiness that the entire PCB is working. And guess what? It does take so long. I'm always excited when I get my PCBs shipped right to my home, a modern day convenience. A quick visual inspection to check it against the layout that I designed is a must. It helps that I always print the board version and date at the back of my PCB for reference. I don't exhaustively do a continuity check on every track using a multimeter because modern PCB manufacturing is highly mechanized with many steps. The electrical step includes checking the integrity of of the traces and the through hole connections. A flying probe tester checks each net to ensure no open circuits and shorts to any other nets. I don't think I'll be better than any machines in checking the traces, but just for fun, I probe some of the pins. This time though, there was a glaring mistake on my part. The Gerbers that I generated did not use the correct format for manufacturing. Thankfully, I regenerated the Gerbers and got them manufactured again. So always do a visual inspection first and then mark each PCB uniquely with a permanent marker. For soldering, always prepare two PCBs. If there is an error on one PCB only, it's most likely the soldering problem. If the error occurs on both PCBs, it's a design problem to be fixed in the schematic and layout. Because this is my first version, I also have open jumpers connecting each of my subsystems. I did not solder these at first. As I tested the subsystems such as the LoRa and E-Ink, then I soldered and connected them. Next, I had a lot of intermittent connection issues with the board in general. It was painful and I wasted a lot of time. I had to go through many rounds of reflowing the solder, cleaning the residual flux with flu, and wiping the PCBs clean. For my next PCB design, I'm considering the PCB assembly service. At least the passives and the SMD components can already come pre-assembled. This will save a lot of time in the board bring up process. Before powering the PCB, my emotions are torn between two extremes. I'm both excited and terrified at the same time. To reduce the chance of any magic smoke or you know what I'm talking about, check for any shorts with the power test points and the ground. I set the multimeter to continuity test mode by turning the dial. The multimeter will beep if a short is detected. Check that the polarity of the battery is correct too. Then I plug it into the 5 volts USB connector and measure that my V bus is indeed around 5 volts. I also check that the output of my low dropout regulator is correct at 3.3 volts. Finally, I remove the USB supply, insert the battery and 18650 with button heads and measure the voltage at V bat and the output of my LDO. My project also had one last feature of power management, which is the charging circuit. In this mode, both the USB and the battery are connected. If the battery is charging, the red charging LED will blink. According to the Urban Dictionary, the most reliable source, a botch wire is defined as a wire added to a PCB to fix errors in the layout of broken traces. And they are an inevitable part of bringing up a board, especially if we are testing the first version of our design. My battery measuring circuit already needed a botch. Instead of connecting to the VBAT, I erroneously connected it to 3.3 volts. And the test points saved the day. I could 
could easily cut the previous trace and solder a new wire onto these test points. Sometimes I could even sneak in a little 0805 resistor or an LED to the wire. First, I was so happy that my PCB has 20 odd test points, but that one time I did not pull out an unused pin of the microcontroller and I had to solder a wire directly onto the microcontroller pin. Not a very good idea. So the lesson here is to expect the bodges. And do you also have unused pins? Pull them out as a test point, especially if we are bringing up a prototype board. And after that, be sure to update the schematic and the layout accordingly. We are inching towards the Blinky LED, but first the bootloader. Arduino Zero is used for this project as it uses the microcontroller SAM D21G. Thankfully, the bootloader is already open sourced. After cloning this repository, I had to add in a tiny option D crystalless under the extra flags in file bootloaders zero makefile because my design does not have any crystals. After running the command make, the bootloader bin file is created. To upload the bootloader file onto the microcontroller, I already had a JTAG SWD 10 pin mini connector. Out of the 10 pins, only three pins needed to be connected. There is of course the ground pin. Strangely, when I tried to connect the VTREF pin one to 3.3 volts, it did not work. I had to bend or break off the pin one. I corrected the PCB layout by adding an open solder jumper to allow other types of programmers. After connecting the ribbon cable from the SWD connector to J-Link EDU Mini, I used the Seger J flashlight app to upload the bootloader. Once again, I don't know why it took a few tries and finally it uploaded the bootloader successfully. Plug in the PCB into the computer and the Arduino CLI board list will detect it as an Arduino Zero board. Next, I was eager to create a custom Arduino board like all the boards that I see in the Arduino IDE. To create a new custom board, build upon something that already exists. For example, a fork of the Arduino Core SAMD repository. Refer to other repositories such as the Adafruit NRF52 and ESP32 on how to create custom Arduino boards. The official platform specification documentation also has plenty of examples. My custom board is really simple and that's probably a good place to start, especially if we are creating something new for the very first time. So remove all the other bootloaders and variants and keep only Arduino Zero. Inside the boards.txt, there is only one board. Remove all other boards and add the correct namespace and other properties. For example, the extra flag containing the crystal-less option. Finally, amend platform.txt to give it a new name and version number. Then create a git tag with the same version number and then make a release on GitHub. Download the entire source compressed file from the assets. As the last step, upload this file into another repository and refer to the download link in the package.json file. Once the raw link to this JSON file is available, we can now add this board URL to the Arduino IDE. After restarting the IDE, if we go to the boards manager and search for our custom board, it will be available for installation. So exciting. We can now test to see whether the simplest firmware works, the Blinky LED. Prepare the firmware code with the serial monitor and digital write to put the LED pin to high or low. I did not have a user controlled LED in my PCB layout, so I bought some wire LED and a resistor to create it. After this, we plug in the PCB to our laptop. Select the custom board that we created from the available list, choose the port, install and upload it. If it is successful, we should see the LED blinking immediately. The serial monitor should also display the prints for high and low. As the last step, we have to test out rest of the subsystems on the PCB and I love to use the concept of minimum reproducible code to test the features of other sensors on the board. I start with the schematic itself that has the individual logical blocks. For the LoRa module, I did a transmit and receive test on both the PCBs separately. One PCB was transmitting while the other was receiving. As a secondary test, I also did a peer-to-peer -peer communication by exchanging just 
fast and increasing integer. Here, both the nodes were transmitting and receiving at around the same time. For the GPS module, I brought it outdoors under the open skies for a potential GPS fix. It received the lat long data pretty quickly as indicated by the PPS LED blinking red. And lastly, for the e-ink display, I also tested it by displaying a changing integer on the screen and nothing more complicated. So now that you have gotten a glimpse into some of the steps required to bring up the board, I welcome you to check out the links in the description below that are found on the website hutscape.com. All bodges are patched, of course. I took several weeks to go through each of the steps that I showed. In the end, the most important thing about the board bring up process has nothing to do with the technicalities, but a reminder to be kind and patient with ourselves because it does take time. With that, thanks for watching and see you next time.